Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Mr. Merrigan's Moments in History. Today, we're going to continue um, opening the West, and in this section, this second video, we're going to get into a couple of different things. We're going to talk about the different lifestyles that people were coming to the West for, including, of course, the cowhand or the cowboy, and also this pioneer life, this homesteading life. And so certainly the images that we're looking at of people moving out west, building these sod homes, that really does represent another migration west. And we're going to talk a little bit today about what that journey looked like. So the first main idea, the first learning objective for today is we're going to be able to explain how ranchers herded their cattle eventually to railroad towns. So in some ways we're connecting to what we talked about last time so that they can be shipped to new markets in the north and east. One of the things that the Transcontinental Railroad and subsequent railroads really do for the American experience is that they allow you to live almost anywhere and connect you still to the markets. And in the Midwest, that's what's going to be necessary for the development uh, moving forward is the connection to those markets. So I want to start out with ranching and Particularly during this time period, one of the breeds of cattle that you're going to see frequently are longhorns because they're a tough breed. They are able to, you know, have quite a bit of endurance and sustain themselves, which is going to be required for a cattle drive here. But they're going to roam free in a lot of Texas and the territory around Texas. And this becomes known as open range ranching, which we're going to see is going to be quickly phased out uh, a little bit later. But example of a Texas Longhorn. And the demand for beef is so high right now, particularly in the north and the east, that it opens up this brand new way of living, essentially as a cowboy. And so these long cattle drives would require ranchers to drive cattle east, sometimes as far as 1,000 or even more, uh, miles to a town located near railroads. And then those would be transported to cities where people, of course, would later buy, or, you know, buy the beef. Now, one of the things that makes this even more accessible is once we've got refrigerated train cars. And so cow hands would go on these cattle drives from, especially from places in Texas. And you can see, you know, like from the good night, uh, Loving Trail to the Western Trail, the Chisholm Trail, you know, even to the Sedalia Trail. You guys are seeing it straight out of Texas, you know, near San Antonio or um, certainly not far from Austin either. Uh, but you're seeing basically the growth of what we call the cattle kingdom. And so after the Civil War, you, of course, have that high demand for meat, especially in northern cities. And so... Longhorns, in some ways, were worth 20 times what they were in the north as compared to, say, Texas. And so cowhounds would drive them to where the market was best. And these cattlemen then certainly uh, became, it did become a job that you could do. And one of the things that uh, certainly comes with this lifestyle is a lot of hardship. Certainly the storms, like the dust storms, would you know, especially in Texas and Oklahoma, you know, would beat against you and beat against your cattle. And of course, the big challenge in all of this is you want as many of your cattle to survive as possible, if not all of them. Uh, certainly stampedes. Uh, I can tell you growing up on a farm, raising cattle that once one goes, you know, in the next few follow pretty quickly, you can have a whole herd starting to stampede. Um, certainly rustlers, uh, people trying to steal cattle. Uh, and then of course, riding in a saddle all day for months at a time can make this very hard work. Um, but it opened up a new opportunity, and it opened up opportunity for people who perhaps had a harder time finding that their skills were as valued in other professions. So we've got a lot of veterans of the Civil War, people who you know, were able to survive this bloody war, maybe are cut out to riding a saddle for a long time and being able to protect cattle on the way. You're also going to see a lot of African Americans in search of a better life turn to this lifestyle because in a lot of these 
you know, groups of cowhands, it didn't matter who you were. As long as you could pull your weight, as long as you could do your job and show your worth, it didn't really matter who you were. And so a lot of African Americans in some ways were looking for a little bit of a meritocracy, one in which they could just be valued for their skills rather than who they are or what they look like. Um, Hispanic ranchers, also known as vaqueros, uh, kind of the original cowboy, um, but these are Hispanic ranch hands, and they're, again, some of the first to develop uh, riding, roping, and branding skills. And all of these people found a, a way of life that was could be quite lucrative for them. And so uh, eventually ranching is going to get replaced, is going to eventually replace these cattle drives, and we'll talk about why uh, in a little bit. But for, for a little bit in U.S. history, this was pretty lucrative for a lot of young men. So why were the lives of cowhands uh, and ranchers so difficult on the plains? Uh, pause the video here, certainly if you need to, but the choices include uh, life was lonely, certainly dust and rainstorms were a problem, stampedes or all of the above. You guessed it, that would be all of the above. Certainly all of those would have been issues uh, for cowhands. I also want to talk about and explain how free land and new farming methods really brought a lot of settlers to the Great Plains. And so for my students, um, certainly living here in Minnesota, this would be a lot of our ancestors. This would be a lot of the people who have come to settle our state as well as the Great Plains, uh, including where I grew up in South Dakota. Um, several factors are going to bring settlers here to the Plains. First and foremost is this journey is just easier. Long gone are the days of taking your Conestoga wagon and moving out west because now the railroad can get you there easier, faster, and cheaper. And so, you know, that pioneer spirit is certainly still there, uh, but it looks very different now because of the changes in technology. Now, originally signed into law under by Lincoln, you're actually uh, going to see this take place a little bit later, but the Homestead Act brought farmers uh, to the plains in droves and it brought them here to like the access to homestead and this acquired a piece of land that used to belong to the public domain or to you know the public and essentially it made it private and the 10 percent number that's on the screen right now that's referring to 10 percent of the public land or of the land that was transferred from public to private uh, during that time period makes up about 10% of all the area in the United States um, at the time. And so it brought, you know, many farmers here and they needed to cultivate the land. Now, depending on where you live, building a home could have been challenging uh, because, of course, there aren't a lot of trees and a lot of lumber. So you got to have two options. You could either make a home out of sod, like the ones we saw at the beginning, or after a while, if you could earn enough, you could have the railroads bring in some of that lumber and then you could build a larger home. And you're also going to see that another challenge to all of this is when you have above average rainfall, making this land uh, actually, in some cases, more suitable for farming. But also, of course, you have to be able to manage that annual rainfall. So... Homesteaders begin to settle on the plains. Um, they want to own their own land. They want to be more independent. And this brings people in droves to the Midwest, uh, especially people with agricultural backgrounds. So this brings a lot of Scandinavians who are searching for more economic opportunity because one of the things you see about a lot of people who are coming from Norway and coming from Sweden during this time period is they're not the ones who own a lot of land in Norway and Sweden. They're the ones who are bringing with them, you know, perhaps little to no land, you know, in the homeland. So what you're looking at, you know, is they bring those traditions with you. And so, for example, Ludafisk, for example, is not something that, you know, the rich in Norway would have done. It would certainly refer to um, what people would have done to preserve the little food that they had in the case of fish. You also are going to see African Americans make their way. And they actually, um, this this name that they gave themselves, the Exodusters, 
kind of appeals to two different parts. It talks about the importance of religion, uh, because this, of course, is referring to the book of Exodus here, in which the Jews were leaving and exiting out of Egypt. But it also certainly, so it talks about the importance of religion in African Americans, but it also shows a similar journey because the Jews in the in this book of Exodus are leaving slavery. And that's exactly what many African Americans were doing. So it talks about the importance of religion, but it also builds that connection um, to that similar experience. Now, it isn't as if, you know, there were no challenges because there are there are several. Um, you had to overcome, you know, certainly a challenging climate, um, sometimes windstorms, and especially if you lived a little bit further south, you live in close to what we call Tornado Alley. And so uh, you also had to be able to bust through this tough sod. Now, remember back a little ways, we talked about John Deere's plow, the steel plow, and that's going to make some of this a little bit easier. But certainly some new methods and new tools for farming uh, are going to make this easier. And Sodbusters, again, is the name given to Plains uh, farmers. Now, one of those new methods is called dry farming. And depending on the kind of climate you lived at, like where you settled in the Great Plains, this might have been a better option for you because this was a way of farming in very dry land uh, in which seeds would be planted a little deeper so that they would still have access to some moisture. Uh, and then today, it also includes like um, drip irrigation, which you'll see less water evaporating and more of it soaking into the soil. Certainly windmills were used in order to bring water uh, from wells and, you know, within the ground. And then, of course, you saw barbed wire fencing, which was utilized to help keep cattle in designated spaces. And this is one of the things, barbed wire really, is one of the things that kind of ends that open range ranching. Because it was less about, you know, the open, wide open range to now these segregated and cut off farms. So many farmers in this process also went into debt. Some lost ownership of their farms because they just couldn't pay back their debts. And so you do have a fair amount that failed within the homesteading practice. Last thing I want to talk about for today is the Oklahoma Territory, which again, you might recall was designated even you know, in the time period of Andrew Jackson as Indian Territory with the Cherokee removal. And certainly in the 1830s is when it, it receives this designation. It's kind of the last region of the plains to really be settled. And that really does help highlight where we're going next. Because in all of this process, you are seeing Native people having their land taken away from them. Uh, sometimes by force, sometimes through negotiation, and oftentimes those negotiations are with broken promises. And so that's kind of where we're heading next is you're going to start to see the beginnings of the conflict between Native people and the settlers and Americans moving further and further west into territory that has been theirs for generations. So that's where we're going to wrap up this episode of Mr. Merrigan's Moments in History. For my students, hopefully you've been following along with the guided notes. Please ask any questions that you have. For those of you who are listening, I hope that we are still building up a little bit of your understanding on the road that leads us to where we are today in U.S. history. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.